Well, good morning and welcome to the University Church Facebook Live event on this Pentecost Sunday, uh, May the 31st, 2020. Uh, we hope that we find you safe and well during this difficult time. I have just a couple of quick announcements I'd like to make before we plunge right into things. Uh, a reminder that as we find new ways to cope and be in community with each other, we have online community check-ins. Those happen on Mondays and Thursdays, either at one o'clock in the afternoon or at eight o'clock in the evening. There are different types, either a video, FaceTime style or a chat room text style. And uh, Heather Gillen has information about that. Heather's here in the chat and uh, I'm sure we'll post something about that for you all to see in just a moment. Uh, then in addition to that, I'd like you to be aware that uh, our community garden uh, has not disappeared. It's very much alive. And we've, um, we have a lot of people there working very hard uh, planting for this year's CSA, a Community Shared Agriculture Project. And um, I'm hoping that you'll consider being part of that. If you're interested in that, you can sign up on uh, at the TUC Garden website. Uh, again, I'm going to ask Heather when she has a moment to post the link in the chat here so you can see it. And if having uh, fresh produce, fruits and vegetables and so on throughout uh, the growing season is something that's interesting to you, then um, please go ahead and sign up for that. That would be wonderful. Well, uh, as you all know, this has been an incredibly difficult week, hasn't it? Uh, according uh, to the CDC, deaths directly attributed to COVID-19 have now exceeded 100,000, and that's in the United States alone. Uh, yesterday, according to CNN, one in four American workers have now filed for unemployment benefits during uh, this period of pandemic. So that's all very serious. And then, and then, George Floyd. Um, it's important to say his name out loud, I think, N not simply to cite another statistic or not to quote another news story but to say his name and to recognize you know, George Floyd as a man made in the image of God. Uh, just as you will remember Ahmoud Arbery, uh, who was made in the image of God, who was killed while out jogging in February of this year, or um, Breonna Taylor, made in the image of God, who was killed in her apartment in March of this year, a Botham Jean also made in the image of God. He was killed in his apartment back in 2018. Tamir Rice, made in the image of God, a face I will never forget, who was killed at age 12 in Cleveland, so not far away from here, in 2014. He was playing with a, a toy gun, apparently, and it was mistaken for a real one. He was shot and killed and so on and so on. And so the real names, um, and they belong to real people, and uh, they are uh, really dead. And on Pentecost, we speak of the outpouring of God's spirit. God's, that means God's breath. As you know, there's a Hebrew word, ruach, and a Greek word, pneuma, and they both mean wind, breath, spirit, all of that's all one idea. And so this is the breath of God that is poured out onto all of God's people. And surely we need that as so many of God's people have drawn their last breath and have transitioning from being a real person with a real name to becoming a statistic or a news story or eventually, of course, to being forgotten. Uh, Bishop Gregory Palmer of the West Ohio Conference of the United Methodist Church uh, wrote this week, uh, what a season we have been through and what a week we are in. 
the angst and pain are palpable. I need you to know, he wrote, I share that pain. And I see me in some way, shape or form every time I see video clips from Minneapolis and around the country. I have no illusion. It could have been me. Bishop uh, Palmer, if you didn't realise that, is uh, African-American. That's the world in which we live, he wrote. The death of George Floyd is a painful sequel to much that we've seen before. God help us, if you please. I grieve for the Floyd family and all the families that have had the same or similar experience. God heal their hearts. I shudder as I watch the burning in Minneapolis, but I do watch and choose not to look away. Looking away perpetuates avoidance. I look not to condone, but to be drawn deeper into the compassionate heart of Jesus, our Saviour. Lord, give us eyes to see. So, thank you to Bishop Palmer for sharing those words. So, as we think about this, uh, this week that we have uh, been living in and uh, everything that it is uh, bringing together, we have been thinking about questions of direction and purpose. Where are we going? Why? What is our purpose? We've seen over the last few weeks that uh, those questions are not new questions, that people have been asking these questions all of the way back to the times of writings of the biblical narratives here. And in today's lectionary readings, the readings that were chosen to be used in churches across the world this week by the compilers of the lectionary. The question that's lifted up is, really, to whom shall we turn for guidance? And what might that guidance be? Uh, we see, for example, in the lectionary readings that the psalmist in Psalm 104, speaking of all creation, writes, when you, God, give to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. But then the psalmist, the psalmist goes on to say, when you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. But the psalmist adds a word of hope, writing, when you send forth your spirit, the wind of God, the breath of God, the spirit of God, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. Now our lectionary New Testament reading is uh, uh, one of the classic Pentecost Sunday readings. It's from Acts chapter 2 and that reading follows up on the ideas of the psalmist by quoting from the Old Testament prophet Joel. In the last days it will be God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So spirit, breath, wind. And surely today we need to renew the face of the earth, given that the spirit of God, the breath of God, has been poured out on all flesh. This is a very uncomfortable passage for many. Uh, it, it's a passage that clearly says that the spirit of God has been poured out on all flesh, everyone here. Let's hear now um, the actual passage from Psalm 104 from this week. It's verses 24 to 34, and I'm just going to read it to you. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide, creeping things innumerable are there, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Lophiathon that you formed to sport in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. 
when you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. And may God add a blessing to our hearing of this word. Let's take a moment and pray together, friends. God of all creation, author of salvation, giver of all grace. When you hide your face, we are dismayed. When you take away our breath, our spirit, we crumble into dust. We pray for renewal of the face of the earth upon which we live and move and have our being. We pray that the outpouring of your spirit upon all flesh will unite us with your creation. We pray that your spirit will move us to speak truth to power, to see your vision for us within your kingdom, and to dream the dreams that call us to action. We pray that your spirit will be given voice through our words, will be given form through our being, and will be given power through our deeds. In the name of Jesus the Christ, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, Amen. So, brothers and sisters, on this Pentecost Sunday, the uh, lectionary New Testament reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, the second chapter. It's a long reading. It's uh, 21 verses, starting at the very beginning of chapter 2. So, let me read that to you. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native tongue of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, brothers and sisters, in our recent weeks, we saw in the Gospel of John 
Jesus saying to his disciples, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And it's this passage that shows us the way in which uh, ascension, the ascension of Jesus, then leads into Pentecost. So Jesus ascends and then the advocate, the Holy Spirit, comes at Pentecost. Uh, we looked at this in terms of how the calendar worked a little bit last week. There's really a trifecta of events going on. Easter, Ascension, Pentecost. So uh, the way it works is that 40 days after Easter, and hence always on a Thursday, the Ascension of Jesus is remembered and celebrated. And then the Sunday after that Thursday is called Ascension Sunday. And then 50 days after Easter, or 10 days after that specific Thursday, this Ascension Thursday, we get to a, another Sunday, the Sunday after Ascension Sunday, which is Pentecost Sunday, 50 days after Easter, Pentecost. And you can see the Penta part of it, and Pentecost gives you a clue that it's got something to do with a 5 or a 50. Now, um, I don't want to spend today a tremendous amount of time going through the the history of Pentecost. We, I've done that many times at the University Church, and if you're interested in uh, knowing all of the ins and outs of Pentecost, uh, you could go back on, on, and look on our website in our Sermon Center, and uh, there are sermons from previous Pentecost Sundays that do just that. The Really, the, the key thing to remember is when we're reading in the Acts of the Apostles, it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place and suddenly, and then all this weird stuff happens. So the day of Pentecost had come uh, before the events that Christians later came to associate with Pentecost. And that's because Pentecost is very much um, a Jewish celebration. In early Judaism, at this roughly this time of year, there were a series of three celebrations that occurred. So uh, Passover, and Passover, you'll remember, that's about celebration and remembrance of the people's freedom from bondage in Egypt when they are taken out of slavery, you know, they cross the Sea of Reeds, go into the desert and so on, and they're freed from slavery. That's Passover. And then uh, the celebration that's called the Counting of the Omer, uh, Omer is a measure of grain, and so it's counting the measures of grain that come out of the fields. It's like a harvest festival type of celebration, but it's to, as, as a celebration, it's a lead up, a preparation, if you like, for the giving of the Ten Commandments. So as you celebrate the grain coming in, the people are thinking about faithfulness to God and the Ten Commandments, and then... In Judaism comes the celebration known as Shavuot, Shavuot, which means weeks. You might have heard uh, contemporary uh, Jews speak of uh, the Feast of Weeks, that's that. And the word, actually it's the same word as uh, in Greek we get Pentecost from. So to the, to the Jewish population, that was all about the anniversary of God giving the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. So three holidays in a row, Passover, celebrating freedom from slavery, counting of the Omer, preparing for the gift of the Ten Commandments, and then Shavuot, Pentecost, the anniversary of God giving the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai. Well, when Christians came along, they looked at Shavuot, God giving the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. Pentecost, the same thing, I mean, in Greek, God gives the Holy Spirit to all the people in, by, and around the temple. So it seemed to them to be entirely a parallel thing. And so Christians refer to Shavuot by the name Pentecost from the Greek for 50th day. But um, the Jews had been celebrating it for centuries before this specific Pentecost that we're talking about today, when all of these strange and unusual things happened. So um, this is a, an important point of connection between uh, Judaism and Christianity in the Judeo-Christian tradition 
one could in fact say that what Pentecost really is, this is my, my preferred understanding of it, is uh, it completes God's giving of the law which began with Moses on Sinai and then it ends with the Holy Spirit pouring out on those at the temple. So it's like one great big long event that has bookends. Uh, Moses and Mount Sinai is one bookend. The Holy Spirit and the temple is the other bookend. So what could we learn about this? There are lots of things about uh, what's going on at this particular Pentecost that really matter. I just want to read one little bit of it. And then you can see, I'm sure you'll be able to tell me right away what's going on here. We read that, let's count them off for here, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretans, Arabs. They're all there, aren't they? Everybody. It sounds like a kind of who's who of, uh, of the Middle East at this particular time. What the event that is about to happen at this particular Pentecost this outpouring of the Spirit seems to have expanded itself beyond the limitations of simply the people of Israel to be the people of Israel and everybody else. It's about inclusion. It's about extending embrace beyond, what should we say, the in crowd? people who were already there, who'd been celebrating Pentecost for century after century, and now suddenly something happens and everybody's included. Now, is that strange? Yes, it's very strange. In fact, the people who were there, one group of them, trying to seek meaning, and they say, what does this mean, according to the text? But there's another group here who aren't interested in meaning, and what we read in the text is that others sneered and said they are filled with new wine. Now, let me point out to you that this is, in fact, uh, it's a textbook example of how to dismiss the experience of another. In this case, you simply assert that the other person is drunk and hence everything that they have experienced that they're trying to figure out what does it mean, what does the world look like now, that it's all simply nonsense, because they were drunk. Now, um, there are, of course, other ways that one could uh, dismiss everything that somebody says, but we see an example in the text. It's a classic technique for putting down another person. We'll talk more about that in a minute here. So, what does... Uh, Peter say when these folks are trying to dismiss the experience that's occurring in the temple where people are sensing the breath of God, the wind from God. But what Peter does is he responds, first of all, by dismissing this caricature that they're just a bunch of drunks and instead quotes the prophet Joel. And in the quote from the prophet Joel, he says, in the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon, and what does it say next? Upon all flesh. That's everyone. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So that, I think, is, uh, is really interesting because not only does the uh, prophet Joel say that the Spirit pours out on all people, but he goes on then to say what happens when people actually kind of listen and try and interpret the Spirit and what is the Spirit calling them to do. And we're told of three tasks. Prophesy, see visions, and dream dreams. And I would put it to you, brothers and sisters, that to this day, the Spirit of God moving in the world empowers us 
to do these three things. First of all, prophesy. Now you might say, oh, I can't do that. That's like a Bible thing. Um, well, yes, it is a Bible thing. But yes, you can do it. If you were to read through all of the major and minor prophets in, in the Bible and try and say, what thing do they have in common? They will talk about different sorts of things in, the, in their speaking, in their writing, but they have something in common. All of them engage in speaking truth to power. We see classic examples of prophets going face to face with say, the the king ruling over the entire land and calling the king out because the king has done something that's not appropriate. Today, we can see people speak prophetically. The, the example I usually use is to, um, is to just look around the corner, say, at, uh, at Lake Erie and for a prophet to say, somebody speaking prophetically, to say, if we keep pumping sewage and chemical waste and so on and allowing farm runoff into the lake, what will happen is that everything in the lake will die and we will have killed off this massive body of fresh water and we will be in serious trouble down the road. In other words, if we keep doing this, something bad will happen. But if we change and do something else, maybe we can get to a stage where something good will happen. And um, that's what prophesy, prophesying is about. It's about speaking truth and speaking truth to power. And so speaking truth to power is, of course, a very uncomfortable thing. I'm not sure anybody really enjoys it, but um, it's one of the things that we're called to do. And then we're empowered, according to the prophet Joel, to see visions. I love the idea of us being able to see visions. What's the vision that you have for your life, for your family, for your children, grandchildren, nephews, nieces, brothers and sisters, your neighbours, your neighbourhood? Do you have a vision? In other words, can you see a, a certain preferred future, a compelling image of what the world might look like lying there in front of you, something that has been generated? Maybe it came entirely from processes working in your brain to see this vision. Or, or maybe, maybe there was a voice whispering, a still small voice coming from one sitting on your shoulder, whispering in your ear, helping you formulate a vision to generate an image of what the world might be. Um, people who were able to generate very clear and compelling images of things usually figure out ways to get those things started. They might not, of course, pull them off completely, but being able to formulate a very, very clear vision is important. Most corporations, for example, these days, are all about having a vision statement. Not that they necessarily hold to them, but the, the idea is, is a good one, a compelling image of what the world might be. And then... And this passage has Joel encouraging people to dream dreams. So, of course, it would, be, it would be very easy to slide over right now and talk about Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, in his dream speech. But I'm not going to do that because you all already know it, yes? He, he has a dream and you know what it is. The thing about having a dream is that when you wake up, having spent the night dreaming, it's very easy to let the dream go. Just go jump in the shower, get dressed. The dream just fades away. Some people have a lot of trouble even, uh, say, remembering a dream, that they've had a literal dream. What we're talking about here is a little different. I'm talking about dreaming a dream, the same sort of way that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did. But the difference is in this case that the dream doesn't fade away, that instead you couple it with the vision so you get these compelling images of a future that are far different from our current reality. And then you see how you can be part of making that dream real, making it concrete. So prophesy, 
speak truth to power, see visions, compelling images of what the world might be, and dream dreams. Imagine how we can be part of such a compelling image into a future that's far different from our current reality. So our original question as we, we took a quick survey of the past week, wow, um, and the question then was, well, who do we turn to for guidance? The answer in scripture, because you already knew, the answer in scripture is, is you turn to God, specifically in this case to the Spirit of God. But I would urge you to be very careful about doing that, because when you call on the Spirit of God, asking the question, what shall we do? Where shall we go? And we know what the answer is going to be, because the prophet Joel figured this out and wrote it down. And if we have eyes to see, what we will see is that that same spirit of God that poured out on the people on that specific Pentecost that described in Acts 2 will guide us and lead us to these same tasks. What should we do? Prophesy. Speak truth to power. Do not be silent. Speak up. Speak truth speak it whenever you can to whomever you can see visions so generate compelling images of what the world might be and then share them with others i know we have some folks who are incredibly talented uh, storytellers people who are artists creative artists who can find ways of of generating a compelling image and then sharing it with people in ways that really resonate and then dream dreams. Imagine how we can be part of these compelling images, creating a future that's far different from our current reality. And then turn that from imagination into action. But remember, there will always be those who seek to dismiss the experience of another. In Acts 2, they did it by asserting that those who were seeking meaning must be drunk. So whatever they had to say was just the ravings of a drunkard. But perhaps today people might assert that you and your life experience should be dismissed. They might say that you're too young or too old or too impulsive or too optimistic or whatever it might be. You will remember in the text that Peter, rather than engage these folks who are trying to dismiss other people's experiences, he brushes them aside by turning what they say into a joke. So after people have pointed uh, at the disciples and said uh, they've been, they been at the wine, uh, Peter turns around and says, indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. You know, the implication being, of course, if it was three in the afternoon, it would be fine to be drunk, but it's nine o'clock in the morning, so of course they aren't. It's a joke. So maybe you can find your own way of brushing aside those who dismiss your experiences, because if you put all of your energy into debating people who dismiss your experiences, you'll never get around to uh, prophesying and dreaming dreams and so on and so forth. So to follow the prompting of the Spirit, in this extraordinary week that we've been living through. Prophecy, which is about speaking truth to power. Seeing visions, which is about generating compelling images of what the world might be, and then sharing them with others. And dreaming dreams, imagining how we can be part of these compelling images that would constitute a future far different from our current reality, and then turning that imagination to action. Now, when I think about uh, prophesying, uh, about visions, about dreaming dreams, I personally am always drawn to the words of uh, St. Francis and the prayer of St. Francis. I'm not really sure why, um, but it just pops right into my head whenever I think about those things. So I would like to just share it to you and perhaps it will resonate to you, maybe even in a way that we don't even fully understand. So St. Francis said, Lord, make me 
an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. So brothers and sisters, with the words of St. Francis in mind, would you now join me in praying together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. So brothers and sisters, in the days ahead, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, um, I wanted to uh, mention to you that uh, for those of us who may uh, be able to do it, that supporting the work of the university church during this difficult time is turning out to be very, uh, very important. We also are aware that many people have lost their jobs, have been furloughed, and things are very difficult. So, and for those who can, let me remind you that uh, we have a text to give number 419-987-4075. Uh, one can donate towards the work of the church through the church's website, the University Church Toledo.org. You just click on donate. You can use the Give Plus mobile advice, uh, device where uh, search for the University Church and make a donation. Or you can send a donation in the mail to the University Church at 4747 Hill Avenue, Toledo, Ohio, 43615. That would be wonderful. We have uh, a lot going on here. We're trying to work very hard with the uh, school system, with United Way, and with a number of our other partners here. Um, the situation, of course, economically as well as medically is very, very difficult. And now, as I said at the beginning in the last week, uh, the name, the George Floyd, um, has brought everything into a very kind of sharp focus here. So there is a lot of work to do. If you can help with that, that would be wonderful. And if you can't, please remember everyone in your press. And finally, I would like for... Um, as to move into the week, having passed the peace with each other. Um, it works like this. You say to somebody in the group, may the peace of God be with you, and they respond and say, and also with you. So brothers and sisters, on this day, may the peace of God be with you. Amen. <laughs>